Hallelujah. All right. Well, we, we had a little, uh, I think a little summertime kick in here, but I believe by Tuesday we're, we're going to be right back into the fall weather, and so that makes me very, very happy. So anyway, we're blessed to have everyone this morning. Okay, I'm going to move really right along with what I've been teaching on the power of confessing the word. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in here, by patience, possess your soul. And we're going to talk about this scripture this morning and really begin to move this direction, what I feel the, uh, the Holy Spirit really speaking into my heart to minister to this body. And something really, I believe the Holy Spirit and Jesus is saying to the church today. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. We thank you for truth. I thank you for every person in here. Give us ears to hear what the Word of God has to say. Father, I thank you for the revelation of your abundant love beyond measure, just reaching into our spirits and into our minds. And Father, we give our thought life to you. We lay every thought before your throne. And we thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. By your patience, possess ye your souls. Now, that right there is just an incredible statement. But when you really read the context is when you really get the power of that verse. I was uh, reading, I've been reading through the Gospels and, and, and reading through the book of Luke. And Luke has always been a special book to me. I've always received uh, a lot of revelation from the, the book of Luke. Uh, but here, what has taken place is that Jesus and the apostles had gone into the temple of, of Herod. And the temple of Herod was basically, it's what they called it, it was a Jewish temple, the second Jewish temple, and they basically called it an eighth wonder of the world. It was magnificent. And as they were going through, and the apostles were pretty much oohing and on at the, the, uh, the temple, and all of a sudden, Jesus makes a statement. He just said, look at all this, and there will not be one stone left upon another. And, man, that got their attention. So they were all quiet, quiet until he got outside. And then when he got outside, they said, now, you just said there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And he, they said, now, you got to tell us, when is this going to happen? And then they go ahead and they said, what are the signs of the end uh, of, your, of the kingdom? And when is the end of the world? They actually asked him three questions. And so Jesus begins to tell them what's about to happen. The temple w was destroyed in 70 A.D. under Titus. Titus took the temple, destroyed it, and there was not one stone left upon another it was a very horrible time for the jewish nation but that was to happen in the future but then jesus begins to tell them he goes into their their personal lives and he begins to tell them many of you you're go you're going to be persecuted and not only that you're going to die for the right of knowing me and he said some of you they're going to take before their leaders and they're going to basically kill you and tell everyone they did God a service. Now, how many know to be a disciple of Jesus in that day, uh, did, did, he did not keep a Sunday school chart. Y'all know how many Sunday schools you've been to and, and church services. No, this was signed up. You signed up for life. And they knew that. They knew going into this. But, you know, you can imagine as they're listening to what Jesus is saying, I mean, the reality of, hey, we're going to follow you. Hey, we'll follow you to the ends of the earth. I mean, everybody's on the, on the bandwagon when miracles are happening and all this. But when Jesus says to them, uh, you're going to be thrown out from your families. Many times the very people that you love will be the ones who persecute you because of me and because of the relationship you have with me. And then many of you are going to die a martyr's death. So you can imagine what they were thinking in their minds. And then in verse number 20, right before 19, in verse number 20, Jesus shifts and begins to talk about the actual end of the world, 
the three and a half years of the tribulation period and what is going to happen. But sandwiched in, right in before the, the coming of Jesus, the literal coming of Jesus Christ, right before it is this verse. And he, he grabs their attention, and you can imagine how they were feeling. And he said, but by your patience, possess your soul. Wow. Because he knew what he was saying to them was having an impact. Man, it'd be like me telling Jason and Mandy, thank you so much for the way you minister to the youth, but one of these days, can you imagine? You're going to be drug out. You're going to be beat for me. My goodness, how many know that uh, I don't know if I want to be a youth director? But we have to see the reality of what Jesus was saying. And now this is a word for us today. By patience, possess ye your souls. And everything that's happening in the world today, everything that we watch on the news, and oh my goodness, it's all negative. It, it's, you know, the whole world seems to be imploding. Jesus makes a statement. He told them that the, the, the governments of the world are not destined to stand. They are destined to fall. This world system, as wonderful as our Constitution is, it was not built for eternity. Now, it probably is the best document founded of any nation on the planet. Our founding fathers were men, and, uh, men of prayer. They sought God before they ever wrote the Constitution. And how on earth God gave them the wisdom to come up with three levels of government uh the executive branch judicial branch and and then the, the congress uh, how they did this and how they said it was just a miracle from god it's the wisdom of god it's what's caused america to bloom is our constitution and and our nation has been was founded on truth and it was founded on the gospel and yet we're seeing so much change in the world, you know, and I, I have traveled in and out of uh, Canada. I have ministered all over Canada. And in ministering in Canada, even today, there are certain passages of scriptures that are not allowed to be even read in a, in a church. It's illegal. Because what they say is that you are against, you are a racist or this and that because you're reading certain passages that the Bible makes very clear concerning our sexual identity. So we live in this world that is changing. Everything is changing around us. And our Christian foundation, the devil is going to do everything he can to shake our Christian foundation. But by your patience, possess your soul. The word patience means steadfastness and perseverance. The word possess literally means winning the battle. So this is what Jesus was saying. By steadfastness and perseverance, win the battle for your soul. How many in here know that you're born again, you're going to heaven? All right, here's the truth that the enemy knows. Satan knows he's lost you to heaven. He knows that. So what is the thing that he goes after? He goes after the gift of God that's on the inside of you. He goes after that grace gift, the assignment that the Lord gave you. And so the only way that he can get that assignment and shut it down is through your thoughts thought life he's called the accuser of the brethren do you know the devil doesn't have an ounce of authority over your life man i'm telling you that set me free when i realized that he has no authority over my life at all but what he does he is called the accuser of the brethren and he accuses us where in our thought life now he knows that if he can go after your thinking and if he gets you to think the way he thinks, then what you're going to think, you're going to speak out of your mouth. And out of your mouth, it's going to control your emotions. And then there, he controls your destiny. 
Dr. Carolyn Leaf, which is a born-again scientist, wrote a book called Switch on Your Brain. Anybody ever read this book? It is literally incredible. She is a scientist. And I'm going to read some of the, the information she talks about our thought life and about our brain, because that is her expertise. She says, research shows that 75 to 98 percent of our mental, physical, and behavioral illness comes from one's thought life. Our thoughts produce words and behaviors, which in turn stimulate more thinking and choices that build more thoughts into an endless cycle. Science and Scripture both show that we are wired for love and optimism. Now, I want you to hang on to that. You are not wired toward the negative. You were not created to be negative. You were created to be a positive charge for God because Jesus dwells on the inside of you, and you have faith in him. So the enemy comes after the mind, and some of it has to do with words that are spoken over us. But, you know, if a word is spoken over, over you, I don't care if it's from your parents or whatever, you have authority in the name of Jesus to cast that thought down. And you look at what the Scriptures have to say about you. So when we react by thinking negatively and making negative choices, the quality of our thinking suffers, which means the, the quantity of, the quality of our brain architecture suffers. Taking this into a deeper level, research shows that DNA actually changes shape according to our thoughts. As you think those negative thoughts about your future, the week ahead, what a person might say or do, even in the absence of the concrete stimulus that toxic thinking will change your brain wiring in a negative direction and throw your mind and your body into stress. You know, what Satan does, and, and we, we've all been there, when you know there's something negative that's about to happen in your life and you're going to have to deal with it, and it's starting to create stress. How many of you have discovered your mind will play out every kind of scenario possible? And how many of you know most of the time it's always in the negative? Well, what happens if this person says this? And then what, how am I going to respond to that? And then what happens if they switch it from here? And what if that one doesn't like it? And, you're, and, and the enemy keeps the church so much in chaos based on our thinking that it causes stress. And you say, what's the purpose in all this? The purpose and the chaos is to keep the light of God that's in you shut off. Because he doesn't want you being the light of the world. When Peter says to cast your care, every anxiety and thought upon him because he cares for you, that, that scripture is for every one of us, that we take the thoughts of fear, of poverty, of all the stress, and we literally cast it by faith at his feet in the name of Jesus. Now, let me, say, let me say this. You're going to have to speak it out of your mouth. Very, very important. When the Bible talks about meditating the Word. It didn't sit there going, hum. That's, that's not meditating in God's kingdom. No, meditating the Word is me saying, the Lord God is my strength and my fortress. In Jesus' name, I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the Word of this. My testimony, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Those are thoughts. I want everybody to look at this Bible. This Bible is a book of thoughts. And it's the thoughts of God. I wonder what God is thinking about me right now. You know, he tells you, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I have towards you. They're thoughts of peace, good, and greatness to give you a future and a hope. Well, that person thinks I'm a failure. Well, let them think that. What does God think about you? What are the thoughts of God? Do you know 
man, I was reading Isaiah, some stuff in Isaiah, and I thought, man, God brings us the kingdom. We come into heaven is everlasting joy. Everlasting joy. Everlasting joy. But here's the thing about it. That everlasting joy is in you right now. There's joy in you. The joy is your strength. Your thought life belongs to you and nobody else. Sometimes when <laughs> Kim and I, sometimes I have fun with her, she, she said, what are you thinking? I said, you know, that's the one thing I get to keep for myself is what I'm thinking. <laughs> not you, not nobody knows what I'm thinking right now, and I just choose to keep that to myself. So we laugh, and then she keeps, you're thinking this and that and that. I said, you don't know what I'm thinking. No, that's my, that's my fault. Here's the thing. She makes this statement, so the takeaway here is that when we operate in our normal love design, which is being made in God's image, we are able to change the shape of our brain for the better. Now, this is all scientific stuff and things that uh, tests and all this stuff they've gone through. I'm going to continue to read something that's not in your notes, but she goes ahead and she says this. So when we make a poor quality decision, when we choose to engage toxic thoughts, for example, unforgiveness, bitterness, irritation, feelings of not coping, we change the DNA and sub subsequent genetic expression, which then changes the shape of our brain wiring in a negative direction. In other words, what they prove through all their tests, that if a person thinks negative, speaks negative, constantly speaking against life and all their problems, and they literally begin to wire their DNA toward the negative. And you not only that, you'll chart your course toward the negative. But when you turn around and change it, and she makes this, this statement, she said, this immediately puts the brain in a protection mode, and the brain translates these poor quality toxic thoughts as negative stress. The stress then manifests in our bodies, but the most exciting part of this study was the hope it demonstrated because of the positive attitude. The good choice rewired everything back to the original healthy positive state. These scientists basically prove that we can renew our minds. Well, Pastor Terry, you don't know where I've come from. No, I don't. But God does. And God knows where we're at. And the change begins to come as we renew our mind by steadfastness and by perseverance possess your soul you have the authority to possess your soul you don't have to give your mind away to people well i just believe i need to give away a piece of my mind well you know how many know you've given too many pieces away and that's that's the problem no, we don't need to be giving it away. We need to be transforming it. And here's the scripture. Romans 12, 2 says this. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word conformed to this world means to totally, really give into the culture of this world. Well, it's like I was sitting and talking to some people. I was being very careful what I was saying because they're on a different path than me. But they were talking about, you know, the culture Every, we have to identify with the culture. You, you can't just say the things that you used to say. You just can't uh, preach the Word of God the way you used to and, and all this. And I said, now let's be real super careful here because this is the culture we are all required to, to submit to. Do you know that Jesus isn't going to call us up before him and go, now what, what year did you live? Okay. Oh, oh. You lived there, and this is what y'all believed. Okay, I'll judge you according to what you think. Now, I, I'm sorry. That ain't going to happen. We are judged according to his word. 
and we're judged according to his culture. Now, he said, don't be conformed to the culture, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of the mind, and that you may prove what is and what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. The word transformed in the Greek is the word metamorphosis. Now, the caterpillar turns into the butterfly. Now, if you want to know anything about butterflies, the experts sitting right over here, Carol can tell you in detail. But the caterpillar, how many know the caterpillar? Looking at a caterpillar on a tree, and we all done it as kids and everything, you look at the, those little caterpillars. They don't look like a butterfly. They don't fly like a butterfly. But how many know they're going to turn into a butterfly? Do you know why? Because they've got butterfly life in them. They do. Look at a tadpole. Doesn't jump like a frog, doesn't look like a frog, but honey, give it time. It's going to metamorphose. Why? Because it's got frog life in us. Now, we're all at stages in Jesus Christ, and some of you may not look like Jesus all the time, and you may not act like Jesus all the time, but you are being transformed as your mind is being renewed in the Word of God because why? you got Jesus' life dwelling on the inside of you. And give it time. Give it time and let it produce in your life. By patience, possess ye your souls. When you got born again, your spirit got born again, and without a doubt, man, your mind and your thinking got radically touched. It, it did. But did you discover your mind didn't fully get born again? So your thought life didn't change just instantly. No, our thoughts have to be conformed, transformed by the Word. What a, what a caterpillar will do, which I just love the fact that it does this, I believe God set up this for us to just get a good look at it, and that is it shuts itself off into a cocoon. And in that cocoon is when it is being transformed. Can I tell you something? You can take a, a knife and you can cut a little part out of that cocoon, and you know what? Whether you realize it or not, you think you're helping the butterfly, but actually you just killed it. Because without the pressure, it will never form its wings enough to fly. It has to burst out. So it has to stay in that cocoon. I believe the spiritual cocoon, of course, is Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. It says, but you, when you pray, go into your cocoon your own cocoon and when you have shut the door now here's the thing about this is this is why prayer is very it's great to pray as a group but it's so much really it is between you and God in your cocoon and when you've shut the door pray to your father who is in the cocoon that's where he's at he's in the secret place and your father who sees in secrets will reward you in the openly now Man, what an incredible scripture. You guys, many of you have heard me teach on this, but when you look again at the context that Jesus, this was Jesus' first sermon, and the apostles and disciples and all the people are around, and he said, oh, when you pray, for, you know what he did? He just blew temple worship right out of the water. What do you, what, what do you mean when you pray, go into your closet, pray to your Father? Now, that's the first time they'd heard that. They knew Jehovah God. They knew Jehovah Rapha. They knew all the Jehovahs, but they sure didn't know he's Father. What Jesus moved us into is a relationship with our Father. And he said, and when you pray, do you know none of the Jews had been into the, the Holy of Holies? Only the high priest that was appointed, and only once a year. Only one person ever stood once a year in the actual presence of God. And Jesus is sitting there, and they know what it takes. You go to the temple three times, or you pray toward Jerusalem, and you do all this stuff. You bring your sacrifice and all this. And Jesus just goes, I oh, forget all that. 
I'm here. I'm here to lead you to the Father. So when you pray, get in your cocoon, shut your door, pray to your Father. Oh, I love this. He said the word your and you like eight times in one, one verse. Do you think he's trying to get a point across? He's your Father. Oh, thank God he's my Father. But oh, hallelujah, he's your Father. And he's a good Father. And he says, you go straight to the Father, and he will reward you. God's not a father with a fist. He's a father with open hands to reward us. Now, here's a beautiful verse. I, I love this verse about the power of the Word and really transforming our, our thought life and creating faith. Philemon 1.6, that the communication of your faith may be effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Isn't that powerful? The communication of our faith. In other words, our faith grows and becomes effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in us in Christ. Uh, I encourage you, go through the Paul's epistles, which you can start in the book of Romans. Uh, and just walk it all the way through the book of Hebrews. And what you get, all the scriptures that tell who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you. Those scriptures, when you begin to acknowledge those scriptures, and when I'm talking about knowledge, number one, I'm putting that in my thought life. As Paul said in Philippians 4.13, and most of us know this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know what? That's truth. That's a revelation. But that's also a good thought. And so what am I doing? I'm identifying with the thoughts of God because that's my true identity. The devil would like to tell you you're nothing. You're a failure. You can't accomplish anything. Look at, look at your past. Look at all the things that's happened in your life. No, and you can dwell on that. And if we dwell on that, this is what Carolyn Leaf is saying. What we're doing, we don't even understand it. If we are speaking that, constantly talking that, it is moving your world toward that. But you have the power to change it. You have the power to change your DNA and switch your brain to the things and, uh, uh, that God has to say about you. And you know where it starts? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever comes, and that thought, negative thought, no, I don't, I don't have to take that negative thought. I have the authority over what I think. Hallelujah. Amen. Choose to think the way God thinks about you. Turn your world. Change it. 2 Corinthians 4, 10, 4. For although we live in the natural realm, and this is the Passion Translation, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using man manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, everybody say we capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow to the obedience of the anointed one. You have the authority to capture every thought and bring it under submission in the name of Jesus. Now, and since we're armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. What I'm, what I'm saying is this right here. 
the days ahead, there, there are going to come some very difficult days. But with patience, with steadfastness, and perseverance, possess ye your soul. That was the word Jesus gave to the apostles. You possess your soul. You win the battle of, your, of the mind. Do not let the enemy come in with thoughts of self-condemnation and guilt and shame. If we've made a mistake, thank God we have the blood of Jesus Christ. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we pray, then that blood covers us and you are as righteous as Jesus himself. You're as holy as Jesus himself. As Paul said, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have right standing with the Father. I am, you are literally seated in heavenly places with Christ. Man, the authority that we have and the battles that we fight, it's not with flesh and blood. I, I mean, people can say what they want to say about me. They can, you know, I've had criticism on the books I've written and all this and uh, ugly letters and, and uh, I had uh, a guy who was working for me. I mean, someone, someone got in, broke into our website and wrote the most horrible things about me, accusing me of unbelievable things. And the guy came to me and he said, well, what, what are you going to do about this website? And I said, call the guy who operates our website and pull it down and, and, and fix it. He said, are you going to read it? I said, no, I'm not going to read that junk. <laughs> well, don't you want to know what they're saying about you? Heavens, no. I'm not going to read that mess and put that junk in my mind and then try to fight some warfare with some person. Pull the website down. Get it redone. It's an attack of the devil, but I'm not going to sit and listen to someone who, number one, has no clue about me, does not know me. Now, if you write a letter and you know me, I'll read it. But if I don't know the person, no, I'm not going to read that. No, they don't know me. They're not around me. Be careful who you re what, what you read about yourself. Be careful the people around you and who you associate with. Get around people of faith. Get around people who will encourage you. Get around people that lift you up. Fill your mind with the Word. And this, this is the very first point. I'm going to shut it down, and we'll get into it next week. But we are to capture our thoughts. We have to capture our thoughts. Your battle is in your mind, and Satan knows that. Oh, Pastor Terry, I, I need to go, man, I need to just scream and holler and pray for the victory in Jesus. And Look, you've already got the victory. It already belongs to you. Just start worshiping him for the victory and begin to speak the word of God. This right here, when you begin to speak, first of all, it comes as a thought. I read a scripture, it's a thought. Then it comes out of my mouth. Philip and I were talking right before the service, and I'm going to just, well, matter of fact, let me run over here real quick because this ministered to me the other day. And this is Psalms 46 out of the Passion. Just listen to this. God, you're such a, a safe and powerful place to find refuge. You're a proven help in the time of trouble. More than enough and always available when I need you. So we will never fear if every structure of support were to crumble away. We will not fear even when the earth quakes and shakes, moving mountains and casting them into the sea, for the raging roar of the stormy winds and the crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. God, you are a constantly flowing river whose sparkling streams bring joy and delight to his people. Now, does that not lift up your spirit? 
well, then here's, here's what we do. These, these are thoughts. These are God's thoughts toward you. These are the thoughts that the Spirit of God revealed to David. And then we can say, Lord, you're my safe and powerful refuge. You're my proven help in the time of trouble. God, you are more than enough for me, always available whenever I need you, and I need you now. I mean, he don't mind you saying that. These are thoughts. You're more than enough. So I'm not going to fear to make any difference. If every structure of support totally falls apart, I will not fear. I do not fear. God didn't give me the spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Those are thoughts. And when we begin, we read the thought, we see the thought, we speak the thought, those thoughts begin to turn your life toward faith, toward truth, and toward grace so that no matter what happens and whatever negative thought tries to come in your, your mind, that you know God's for us. God's for me. Who can be against me? And you've got peace that passes all understanding, and it rules your heart. But it all begins with a thought here's a thought himself took his infirmities bore your sicknesses and by your stripes you are healed here's another thought he has translated you from the, from the realm of darkness and translated you in the kingdom of his dear light and here's dear son here's another thought you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus you're more than enough. Here's another thought. He has bore our infirmities. He bore all our sins, and we are forgiven through Jesus Christ. Man, whoo. Now, here's a book of thoughts. Now, if we're going to be transformed to his image, then we've got to know that you have the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ. There are, there are those that are in here, your life has almost been a, a record of defeat, one thing right after another. And the Holy Spirit loves you. It's never a question about His love. Grace is here, but we have to have faith to appropriate the grace. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Right now, whatever's coming out of your mouth, just stop it and start thinking the thoughts of God. The Holy Spirit is here to teach you, instruct you, and walk with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. He loves you. But today, today is a new day. Today's a new day. I believe decisions are being made right now in this service. No longer am I going to sow negative thoughts. I'm going to start speaking the word of God. I'm going to start thinking the way God thinks about me. And he loves you, and he loves invading. And, Father, I break every assignment of the enemy, everything, every generational curse is broken I don't care what the generation of the hatred and the venom that's been spoken over anyone in here. In the name of Jesus, that is broken. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You are a child of the living God, and God's grace is upon you to win. He is your victory, and the Lord is strengthening you today, lifting you up in his love, giving you a revelation of his love towards you and his love for you. And I thank you for it, Father, right now. Everyone stand, and, and Mark, you can bring the lights down. And I want our elders to come up. Uh,